Can you hear me now? Good. I was uh, saying thank you so much, Baltasar, for having invited me. Thank you to you all and to the foundation, to the staff of the foundation, and to Maria for this organization of this wonderful um, conference. So this is not expected to be. I don't want it to be like a funeral when everyone talks about the goodness of the person who is dead. So it is, uh, I hope it is a place for us to see how much progress we have made in Spain regarding international jurisdiction and how this uh, principle could be uh, applied as uh, wide as possible, as broadly as possible. I believe that international um, humanitarian, um, as it is stated in the international humanitarian law. So I would like to focus on the reasons that, to my mind, has triggered the development of the universal jurisdiction as it is nowadays. Well, first of all, it is uh, not up until the 90s where cases are prosecuted and well considering that the legislation had been there some time before. And I believe that there are two reasons explaining that. First of all, the organic law of the uh, judiciary power that established this absolute uh, principle and then of universal jurisdiction and second, the existence of a basic instrument so that is supporting the, these initiatives. That is to say, exerting civil and criminal jurisdiction on the part of the victims. And that is to say, public that want to file the case to, uh, to the, the file these cases. So here we have victims and association of human rights, and that's the reason that have driven them to uh, present these cases or to bring them to, to the courts. And then also very important, a human factor. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and uh, to recognize Baltasar Garzón. He was the first person that when he received demands for justice from victims of the dictatorship in Chile and Argentina. He took a step forward and he decided to open up that door and to walk that pathway so that those of us that came after him could follow him and actions that were confirmed by the Supreme Tri Tribunal Criminal Courts of uh, national courts, etc. Now I'd like to refer to a case that has been uh, finished, uh, well, or a few years ago, and it is pending uh, trial. So, and I'd like to refer to the Rwanda genocide or to the area of the Great Lakes, because this is not limited to Rwanda only. So this Great Lakes uh, area is uh, still suffering from a silent conflict. And we're behind this continuous fight between guerrillas and the military. We find a number of uh, lots of economic interests because this is an area where some unique mineral ores are produced or are found in this area, which are essential for new technologies such as, and I'm referring to coltan. So what I'm saying is that it is a highly strategic economic area for states and for international companies. So right from the beginning, Law, uh, complaints were filed against victims or nine Spanish nationals. And in the last amendment of the, well, these, uh, um, despite the last amendments, well, they are still um, contemplated 
the last amendments of the law, they are they still full under the Spanish law. I would like to mention that the relatives of these nine victims appeared in trial, and they also. Well, we also had the significant role played by um, Aleph Perez Esquivel, Nobel Prize of uh, Peace, Miss McKinsey, the, also the Council of Manresa, Navasa, many councils in Spain, as well as uh, public institutions and bodies that had been that were related to the Spanish victims. And then up until a total of nine associations for support of victims, associations uh, to promote dialogue in the area of Great Lakes, headed by Solivar Association and by Joan Carrero, who is a person who had had the soul to continue promoting and moving forward this uh, uh, process since the beginning. He's kind of the, uh, he's the equivalent of the Alan Canton scene for the TV course. So now, and also when we are talking about people, it is mandatory to thank for the Activity, their activity all throughout these years, the legal experts and the law, lawyers that are here in these round tables, such as Almudena, also Almudena Bernabeu, Joan Garcés, Bernabé, many of them, they are the soul of the activities and the actions that have been carried out for universal jurisdiction and for human rights law. So, and then it was back in 2005 where the complaint was filed. And then in the over three years, a hundred of victims and witnesses appeared to court. And well, to come over here, they had to they had uh, economic difficulties because some of them were coming from uh, places in Africa or in Europe where they were living or where they had found um, refuge. And so also because the Ministry for Justice was not paying for the traveling expenses. And also because of the fact that in nearly all the cases, uh, these people needed a visa to uh, enter Spain. And that visa can only be um, achieved if it is requested through the um, courts. That's the way we did it. And then in this case, I must say, and I, have to, I am very thankful that the Ministry for Foreign Affairs had cooperated with the courts at all time. And then with the added difficulties that we, uh, the witnesses were protected witnesses, their identity was to be unknown, and then the Ministry of Affairs and the consulates in the um, relevant country should, could not disclose the names of the witnesses that were requested or called upon the, uh, to appear in court. After taking these depositions at uh, the National Criminal Courts to this number of uh, witnesses, and also the positions from, from people who had been in the government, in the government of the Rwanda government. It concluded, it was finished with the, in the 6th of February through a deed that establishes, established the facts the charges and then as well as the norms, implementing norms at that time for the facts that were being investigated. 
realidad de los hechos y según a cada persona se le acusaba de So uh, people were um, accused of genocide belonging to terrorist organizations uh, torture etc The prosecution led to the issuing of 40 international arrest warrants against 30 people, primarily high commanders of the Rwandan governments at the time. Through which these people had to become part, had to be registered within Interpol, and this also caused great difficulties. And especially, I'm referring to the US because the US didn't want to register these international arrest warrants. And they were putting barriers all the time as to the date of birth, uh, photo, uh, photo, place of birth of these people. And we all know that the, all those were adding to the difficulties that we were having because we were far away from those registries. So, so the first questions that the first question that we have found was difficult difficulties on the part of uh, of courts where we cannot really access public files where we cannot really access the registries of the police and where we find the greatest barrier from the governments in these uh, third countries. OK, this is one of the main difficulties that we have for our investigation. The next turning point after the issuing of the deed in 2008 prosecution ruling or did, then in 2010, a deed was uh, issued in July 2010, requesting the extradition of one of the accused, Kajumba Watson, more specifically. This person, who was second to uh, the Rwanda government, and the president at that time was Paul Kagame, for some, for political reasons, he decides to oppose his uh, boss and the government uh, regime. And then he had to find refugee in Africa. Then we heard that the, he had been shot in Africa. And then the Rwanda government was accused of planning this, uh, the shooting of this person. Of, in any case, we requested the extradition of this person to the South African government. The Spanish government approved this extradition in September 2010. And ever since then, the South African authorities had had the extradition request on the table. And so far, we have not received any answer whatsoever from the South African government. The conference that uh, was given by Kenneth Mann later on highlighted the importance of uh, whenever it is not possible to prosecute the person because the person is not present, is not face to face, he talks about the importance of having information about the investigating phase and all the procedure. And I would like to honor, to pay tribute to these uh, nine victims that have victims that, well, that we have been working on for these nine years. So hopefully we will be able to keep the process open for some uh, on the grounds of some of the courses that I will mention later on. I would like to mention Joaquin Balmayor Salas 
Kampala. He is a priest and he went to Rwanda to work back in 1965. He used to uh, work in uh, charities in the diocese in the north of Rwanda. He used to openly denounce the miscarriage and injustices in that place and on people of different ethnicities. He wrote, and I think this is what he was sentenced to death, that Tuxis has launched an international campaign of misinformation to make the world understand that the victims are the assassins and the other way around. So within this framework, he issued a number of announcements and declarations confirming that sometimes the corpses were identified as Tutsi victims when they were actually Utu victims. A few days later, after issuing these declarations, 26 of, 26 of April 1994, the military or the army people of FBR killed him Oh, made him disappear, and then his corpse has never been recovered. Three days before, a collaborator, one of his collaborators, had been murdered. Before, when he asked for explanations to the FBR, so the court that I had issued a demand to the Rwanda authorities and uh, trying to find out whether some um, investigation has been carried out about the death of this person. And up until today, I have not received any answer from them. Servando Mayor Julio Rodriguez, Miguel Angel Isla, and Fernando de la Fuente, most of them coming from Burgos, uh, with the exception of Julio Rodriguez coming from Valladolid, were uh, religious people, priests that were part of the community that were living next to a um, uh, camp of refugees caused in the city of Bukavo. So there were 30,000 refugees in that camp, and they were living two or three kilometers away from the camp. And they set up a school next to the camp for, and where they were teaching, uh, well, um, up to 5,000 children at the end of October 1996, despite the uh, the advancement of the Rwandan military towards the camp, these priests decided to stay uh, close to the refugees, to be there, to stay with the refugees. And then in October 1996, Servando, through one of the radio channels here in Spain, he sent out an urgent, an urgent. He 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 asked for urgent help at that time. So, 31st of October, the military of FPR in Rwanda reached the camp, and then that very same morning, Fernando Mayor talked on the telephone and he said that the camp has been emptied and that they were they were expecting an attack at any minute. Then in the afternoon, he talked to one of his relatives. The conversation is recorded. And as he is talking on the telephone, he is attacked. Well, he is visited by some people. Uh, he said to his relative, I said, well, is it a good or a bad visit? Uh, he says, I think I'm afraid this is not a good visit. So no news about this four priests up until November, 9th of November, 1996, were 30 meters away from the residence. They were found in a well, in a well and with signs on the body of having been tortured, um, brutally killed. The, they were uh, returned to Spain, and then autopsy was uh, performed on the bodies. Madre Alfaro Sirera, Madre El Madrazo, and Luz El Tuña were members of the Medicos uh, del Mundo, or Medicos Mundi. At the end of November 1996, they were in Rugel Heri in Rwanda. They were there with a project in order to train health personnel and to improve health facility. 
and since 1990, since January 1997, they had always been in charge of uh, distributing medication. A few uh, at that time, they just went to a nearby place to distribute these uh, med drugs. And then the, when they went there, they could see that more than 50 people had been killed. They started to offer help to the people that had been injured. And as they were doing so, one person tells them that close to there, another massacre had been made or carried out. They went to that place, and actually, they have found a massive killing of, of more than 100 people. This uh, fact was known by the intelligence services of the FBI. And then a few days later, on the 18th of January, in the evening, around 8 o'clock in the evening, they uh, received a visit of a group or a squad of armed people when they were requested to show them their passport. And the head of the squad took the passport away. And later on, he gave an order to shoot them. And then these uh, three people died. At that time, there was a US national, Nitin Magdal. He managed to run away, to escape. He was only shot in one of, on one of his legs. Uh, he, well, he told us uh, what had happened. Well, same as in previous situation, the court that I had requested the Rwanda government whether they has uh, carried out any kind of investigation and the response once more has been silenced and other victim is Isodro Gutpon Kauso also from Gipuzkoa a priest he was killed years later, more specifically in the year 2000. Over all this time, he had lots of conflicts and clashes with the Rwanda authorities. He was accused of being uh, to commit genocide himself. So uh, according to the testimony, in July 2000, a young person came in a car together with a sergeant and two unidentified civilians, uh, taking advantage of the entry into the parish of the assistant of Sidrom Iskurun, Silvan Ruinda, and the sergeant walked in. The first one was were holding a gun, the other one a Kalashnikov. They requested uh, the priest to give them the car keys. He was also asked to give them money. He gave them money. And then when they asked further money or more money, um, he refused to give them money. And he said, well, if you're here to kill me, you can kill me now. And actually, that's what they did. They shot him on his face. No information has been received from the Rwanda authorities in terms of whether they have carried out any type of investigation for these acts. Well, these are the specific facts that are impacting or that are affecting Spanish nationals. Here we have cases of genocide and cases of crimes against humanity that resulted in the death and in the disappearance and elimination of this person as inconvenient witnesses or people who were likely to denounce these uh, massacres. Well, that's where we are today. That's the, the situation that we're facing after the amendment uh, last March about the universal um, international 
justice when it is complicated. However, we have to be optimistic about a reform whose technique is so poor, so crappy, that the only thing that has achieved so far is that 43 uh, drug dealers have been released and have and none of the cases have been filed. None of the cases for which this uh, amendment had been conceived have been filed. So we should emphasize or highlight from uh, strictly or purely legal viewpoint the following. First, if this amendment breaches the principle of effective protection. And according to the facts that I've just mentioned, well, it's up to you to f reflect and to think that if the relatives in before this situation or if this cause were to be filed, whether the relatives will find no protection whatsoever by the legal uh, bodies, both in Spain and in Rwanda. And second, we should take into account that the parliament has, has the competency to uh, to make laws, but the interpretation and application of law should be carried out by the courts. And so according to the separation of powers that I believe it exists in this country. So we cannot really say that a cause can be dismissed, but you can say that if these requirements are not fulfilled, well, the cause will be a dismissal cause. But however, according to this law, they the dismissal is established, the dismissal of the cause is established up until these requirements are not presented. And tell me, how can you present these uh, requirements if there is no cause for it? So sometimes it is important to take one step back in order to take two steps forward. So I hope that this conference is the seed to give impetus and to drive forward uh, universal jurisdiction. And I think these uh, boosts should not be given from the Spanish um, arena, but from the European Union arena, where we are living in common justice and freedom. And I believe that all the European Union countries should shed uh, implementation principles for the execution or application of uh, universal jurisdiction principles. Thank you. ...of the law of the uh, judge, of the current judge. And now for Fernando Andreu, what can you tell us about the initiative for Gaza and Palestina and the impact that they had about this morning? So I leave you with your questions. Uh, and on my part, I'd like to make a reflection. Well, regarding what Fernando just said, well, what would happen at this point in time with the case of Great Lakes if the lake problem? Briefly, as for Gaza, as the Baltazar explained, a group of Palestinian victims watched a claim after a bombing of a house in the strip, bombing by the Israel, Israel's uh, army, in order to murder Salah Hehade, who was a member of Hamas. It is true, they killed this one, but they also killed 14 more people. For example, eight kids living in the southern house or southern part of the house. So there was a claim lodged by the victims. It was lodged here in Spain. And, well, I hadn't time just to allow it to, to proceed. There was an appeal. And then the Ministry of Justice from Israel 
requested Minister Moratinos to amend or, or, or file away this case, and this led to the change, uh, an amendment of the law in 2009, where Spanish jurisdiction was limited to condition uh, that there had to be Spanish victims or pertinent causes, so it was filed away. Here, where we see that there's been an amendment after what happened in Tibet, what worries me, what makes me uh, lose all hope is the fact that justice is treated as a, a good as an article. So I help you, I change the law as long as you buy me a debt or something like that, or as long as we have a good uh, business relation. So given governments, such as the Spanish one, they're using justice as a token, exchange token, in the face of other interests, such as financial or strategic interests which is something that our political representatives are saying loud and clear, and they say that these kind of proceedings are not productive. They say this is just expending too much expenditure, and so nobody nobody's happy, but that's not the truth. The truth, those of us who are familiar with this kind of procedures and those of us working with victims, we know firsthand, we know firsthand that, first of all, the victim before a sentence, what they want is to be heard. They want to be taken care of by justice so that everything possible is done to prosecute victims. I, I think that remedied reparation is the list they were about. They just want.